Hi, I'm Miri Pomerantz Dauber. I'm the uh, book club's director of Jewish Book Council, and I'm here tonight with Dara Horn, um, who's a wonderful author of many Jewish interest books, as long as well as um, amazing fiction. Um, and Dara is, um, I'm going to just tell a little bit about her. Welcome to the first of the 24 by 24 sessions. Um, Dara received her PhD in comparative literature from Harvard University in 2006, studying Hebrew and Yiddish. In 2007, she was chosen by Granta Magazine as one of America's best young novelists. Her first novel, In the Image, was published when she was 25. Her second novel, The World to Come, received the 2006 National Jewish Book Award for Fiction, which is from the Jewish Book Council, and the 2007 Howard U. Ribolo Prize, and has been translated into 11 languages. Her third novel, All Other Nights, was selected as an editor's choice in the New York Times Book Review and one of Booklist's 25 Best Books of the Decade. Wow. In 2012, her nonfiction ebook, The Rescuer, was published by Talent Magazine and became a Kindle bestseller. Her newest novel, A Guide for the Perplexed, was published just this past September by W.W. W. Norton. She has taught classes in Jewish literature and Israeli history at Harvard, Sarah Lawrence College, and City University of New York. And she's lectured at over 200 universities and cultural institutions throughout North America and Israel, some of which went through Jewish Book Council's JVC Network program. So Dara and I have worked together a number of times before. She lives in New Jersey with her husband and four children. Um, and so with Dara's new book, I've had the pleasure of recommending it to book clubs um, for the past few months since it came out. Um, and it's great. There's a lot to talk about. We're going to talk sort of about both the book and to Dara in general about being a Jewish author and the way that Jewish texts and Judaism fit into her creative process. Um, so Dara, for the first question, um, what is, this is sort of a general question, but what is the relationship between Judaism and your creativity in your writing? Sure. Well, I want to say first thank you to Miri and to everyone at, uh, involved in Global Day for inviting me uh, to participate this evening or whatever time of day it is, wherever you're logging in. Um, so the connection between Judaism and creativity is something that is very important to me and very inspirational in my work. Um, I, I think that there's sort of an... I'm going to speak in very, very broad generalizations, but I would say that there's actually... Um, there's a, a Western idea of creativity and a Jewish idea of creativity, which are actually quite at odds with each other. Um, we have a Western idea, at least since, the, let's say, maybe the Renaissance or a little bit later, of, uh, of the artist as being someone who creates things out of nothing. That this is someone who's, what's most important about them is how original they are, and that what makes their work valuable is how how new what they have to say is. And not only how new what they have to say is, but how, how much they're able to be completely innovative on their own. You have this ideal of the artist in Western culture as this like genius in a garret, preferably dying of tuberculosis, um, but really someone who's inventing these things themselves. In Jewish culture, and again I'm speaking in very broad strokes, but in Jewish culture I think you really have the opposite idea of creativity. In a sense there's this idea that what makes you, what makes your work valuable as a Jewish writer, or probably in other art forms as well, but you know, I speak as a writer, as a Jewish writer, in a sense what makes your work valuable is not how original you are, but how unoriginal you are. And what I mean by that is how well you are able to incorporate older texts into what you're saying, and in a sense because we have this idea of this ultimate text of the Torah, and that there's, there's an idea that anything that's created beyond that in Jewish literature is in some way related or a commentary on the Torah. And so that's one way that it's different, is there's an idea of being unoriginal in some way is more important than being original. Um, or at least if you're going to do something new, it should be something a, a new way of integrating something old. And then I think there's also this idea of the, the artist as this isolated genius, which is also something that's quite different from Jewish culture, because in Judaism we don't have this emphasis on individuality, we have an emphasis on community. And I think that the idea of Jewish creativity is a much more of a collaborative process, where you have many, many voices that are participating, um, where you don't have, where a lot of our greatest works, at least in the traditional religious sense, are not works where there's one person's name on the cover, but something like the, the Mishnah or the Gemara, where there are many, many voices. And in a sense, that's the model. And so I think as a writer, um, writing in a Western language, but writing f out of a Jewish tradition, I, this is something that I think about all the time, is that question of originality and, and, um, and creative collaboration. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And in your latest book, there's, a whole, there's both plots, 
going on at the same time. The sort of the Jewish creativity coming from the plots around the Rambam and Solomon Schachter, and then also an entirely original plot um, with the more modern characters and the whole idea of the Geniza software that's collecting everything from our lives and and saving it for um, review at some point, I guess, its own Geniza. Um, so you've written about many different people and texts and points in Jewish history, Chagall and Der Nister, the Civil War, the Rambam and Schechter. How do you settle on your next topic or decide which ones to include in any given book? Oh, I mean, I wish I had a, you know, people ask me this question about a creative process, which I always think is a funny question because it implies that I have a creative process. <laughs> <laughs> and what I mean by that is, you know, I, 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 it's very unpredictable. It's not the kind of thing where I sit there and I say, like, oh, for my next book I'll do something medieval, and for my next book I'll do something ancient. Like, I'm not thinking that way at all. In fact, I can tell you with my with my newest book, A Guide for the Perplexed, um, this is, um, when I set out to write that book, my intention was to write an entirely contemporary story. That was what I meant to do, and the reason I did that was because, as you mentioned, I had a previous book. The one I wrote right before that was about Jewish spies in the civil, the American Civil War. I have to say American because it's a global day. Um, and when I did that, um, I had a lot of fun promoting it because what would often happen, it was fun at first and then got creepy. What would happen is I often would go to a bookstore or something like that, not so much at Jewish Book Council events, but often when I would go to a, a venue to, to talk about the book, people would be in the audience like wearing costumes. Um, this is a thing that's part of American culture. Yeah, like dressed as the reenactors, where they're reenacting okay. the Civil War. They come with their muskets and their insignia and everything. And for anyone watching this from uh, other countries, this is sort of a this is a part of American culture where there are people who are these enthusiasts who act out the Civil War. So th this was. Uh, well, first of all, I, I was very alienated by this, that these people were telling me how, oh, we set up our tents every year in Gettysburg and we reenact the battle, and I'm laughing, like, you people are such morons. I mean, I didn't say that, but I'm thinking in my head, oh, these people are idiots, but then, of course, I go home and I build a sukkah in my backyard. <laughs> to me, it's like, you know, that's the same thing. Judaism is all about reenactment. So I, I came to see it in a different light. But the reason I mention this now is because um, this... Uh, you know, I was I, I got a little bit alienated from the historical stuff by all of these people who were taking it so seriously. <laughs> and so I said from you know, I, I don't need people showing up in costume to my events. I'm just gonna write a contemporary novel. Um, as you said, I write the, the contemporary story in my novel is about a software developer who creates a, an app, a, a program that records everything that its users do. And the contemporary story is about her um, she ends up doing a business trip in post-revolutionary Egypt. She ends up getting kidnapped. Um, but a lot of it is centered around her relationship with her sister, who's very jealous of her, and there's this acrimony between them. But then I start but what happened was was when I started writing that story, I would say that actually my intention was not to write about a particular historical period as much as um, the one thing that did inspire me in creating this contemporary story. It's funny you said it was a totally original story, but actually it's not because it's what it is is it's a rewriting of the Joseph story from the Torah, but with women characters instead of men and set in contemporary times. And so that was what I was intending to do in that contemporary piece. But then what happened was I realized that as I, was, I have this character who's created this software app which records your whole life and so it makes memory unnecessary. And so when I was exploring that idea, what I saw was that it was, I, I, it didn't make sense to to not test that idea against the past. Um, I wanted to go back in time to sort of examine what people thought they remembered versus what really happened. And to do that, I wanted to do against something that was that mattered more than just one person's childhood. And I knew about the Cairo Geniza, and, uh, which was, of course, this uh, tremendous uh, storage room in a medieval synagogue in Cairo. It was discovered in the 1890s, and it was this uh, trove of manuscripts that went back to the year 900. It was 193,000 documents. And so that got me thinking about this question of data storage then and now, what we save, why we save it. So, I, you know, I wish my, my process were more predictable because then when I'm going on to write my next book, I could say, like, okay, well, now I'm going to go, I checked this off that I wrote about medieval times, and now I'll go write about, you know, a different century. But unfortunately, it doesn't quite happen that way. I, my books tend to start with a story, um, with an incident, with, an, with, the, uh, with a situation. Um, rather than me looking for a particular period. Although I do also think about biblical antecedents as I'm writing that initial story. So when you um, have started writing and then are later coming in with 
how do you decide, you know, you're writing about the Joseph story. How did Solomon Schefter make his appearance into your book? How did the Rambam come in? How did you weave those two together? Or in the world to come, how did you, I mean, it's about a Chagall painting, but how did you sort of decide who you're going to bring in from Jewish history that to work through into your book? Um, I, I imagine this like rogues gallery of people who are just sort of <laughs> selecting. No, <laughs> um, it's really it's it, it it happens through the story. I mean, uh, like I said, this is I intended to write an, a, a contemporary story, and then it didn't work out that way. Um, I knew I was going to write about the Geniza, and then when I realized I was going to write about the Geniza, the Cairo Geniza, um, not the software Geniza that I invented in the story, but the Cairo Geniza. I felt that it was. Um, I I didn't. I knew that Salman Schechter had been involved in discovering this Geniza. I didn't know anything else about how it was how it was found. Um, and then I discovered this amazing story about how there were these two widowed Presbyterian Scottish sisters who had been Bible hunters who were traveling in Egypt finding manuscripts and how they knew Schechter and that was sort of the route through which he found out about the Geniza. And I mean, at that point. Um, I was thinking about Schechter, and then I started reading a lot of his writing, and I heard that voice. Um, and then when I decided to wind it even further back to Maimonides, that was something that actually made me very nervous, because, you know, of course, in the Jewish world, Maimonides, or as we would say, Rambam, he, he's not really a person anymore. He's more like an idea um, or a concept. He's like a brand, right? Like he's, well, Schechter is also a brand, right? Um, these aren't, we don't think of them as people. And so, you know, as a novelist, I'm interested in, um, there's a, the Yiddish poet Avram Sutzkever has a, a verse in one of his poems where he talks about turning paper back into trees. And in a sense, I feel like that's what I'm trying to do. Now, I don't know that I succeed, but I'm trying to do that in sort of bringing these people who we think of as just an idea and making them a person again. And with Rambam, that was particularly challenging because, you know, it's writing about the 12th century is a little harder than writing about the 19th. And um, But fortunately, thanks to the Geniza, we know a lot about daily life. We know a lot about, and we, there are letters from him where you hear his personal voice, you hear his voice in his books. Um, so I don't really choose these people. And you mentioned my early, one of my earlier books, The World to Come, where Chagall is a character in the book. Um, one thing that I have worried about, actually, is when I, 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 I worry when I write about real people um, real historical figures. There's, first of all, for myself in terms of the integrity of the person, because I know that unlike my other characters, these are people who really did live and really had their own consciousness. And I, you know, for me to appropriate that conscious, consciousness is something very, that you know, it's it's a little bit arrogant. And and I try to be very careful in honoring that person's voice as much as I can. Um, then you have an, a separate problem, which is the angry heirs, <laughs> um, and that I discovered. Well, and at least I was worried about it with um, the book where Chagall is a character. Um, I remember that when that book was first being published, uh, Chagall's granddaughter contacted my publisher and wanted an advanced copy of this book, and I got very nervous. I'm thinking, like, here comes the lawsuit. But um, she actually ended up, she liked it a lot, and she thought it was a very, you know, a very worthy portrait of her grandfather. Um, so that, you know, I walked out on that one. And um, I also felt a Der Nister, who's a Yiddish writer, is, who's was one of the people who was uh, basically murdered by Stalin, um, is a character in that book, too. And I remember that... Um, a, few, a year or two after that book came out, I was invited to speak in Israel, and while I was there, um, there was an elderly woman who contacted me who was, she had been a child had, living across the hall from Der Nister. Their families knew each other. She was the daughter of Benjamin Zuskin, who was one of the, um, involved in the Yiddish theater in Moscow. And she knew Der Nister personally, and she, uh, yeah, we, we were having coffee together, and she looked at me and she said, how did you know what he was like? And so that was very gratifying to me that I felt like I had gotten this person right in some way. So, of course, only he would be able to judge that. So I have um, a question from that, but just I forgot to say in the beginning that if anyone who's watching has questions for Dara, we will be taking question and answers toward the end. Um, and you can tweet in um, or on Facebook send a message through the Global Day website. There'll be, there is also a form there. Um, so toward the end, if you have a question that, for Dara, please send it in. Um, so my question is, how do you go about doing that, what you were just talking about, taking a historical fact or a personage and turning it into a fully fleshed out living character? Um, well, I guess it's, oh, sorry. No. No, it's, okay, you're sure. Well, it starts with some, with, with reading, obviously. I mean, I am doing research for these books. Um, 
And but it's not the kind of thing where like I sit and read eight books about this person for a year and then I go and write the novel. I start reading something, usually something that if it's a person who's their, they were a writer, it's something in their voice, something that they've written. And then usually there's a detail that captures my interest. So with um, with Rambam, with Maimonides, um, there's a, a letter that was found in the Geniza in his handwriting that was, um, you know, it was a letter, a personal letter that he had, was writing to a colleague. Um, and it talks about how he was mourning his brother. And it, it's, a, it's a very beautiful language. And actually, it's I talked to before about um, the lack of originality. It, almost all of that letter is, is, is sort of a pastiche of biblical phrases, which is sort of just the way people were writing at that time. And something that I also bring into my work, or at least try to. Um, but it's, it's a very beautiful letter, which really talks about this you know, tremendous pain that he had. He compares himself in mourning. He said he's been mourning for eight years. <clears throat> his brother, he says, brought his brother drowned in the Indian Ocean. Um, his brother was a merchant dealing with India. And he said that his brother drowned in the Indian Ocean, and there was this detail in it that said, and it was this beautiful letter where he, um, he compares himself to um, Jacob in the Bible mourning for uh, the loss of Joseph, his son. Um, and, you know, when he says that, um, you know, I will go down to Sheol in mourning for my son, Sheol being this, uh, you know, biblical idea of the, the netherworld. And he, com he uses that line to describe himself mourning for his brother. But yet, somewhere in that letter when he just talks about how his brother drowned, he said, my brother drowned in the Indian Ocean with a great deal of my money. And it just seems so out of place when he was this, this sort of tremendously deep grief that he was expressing that he would even mention this, that like, oh, and by the way, yeah, he lost like a ton of my money when he drowned. And then it also made me wonder, well, why was, why was he traveling with your money? And that sort of made me travel down that road of exploring this relationship a little bit more deeply because also most, um, Maimonides' brother also becomes a character in the book. And so it's something like that where there's a detail that leads me to travel down this road a little further. Um, with Salman Schechter, I think it happened when I knew he was looking for the Geniza, and I knew he was dealing with these two Scottish uh, widowed twins, these two women. Um, and my main story was about this relationship between sisters. It was all related to the Joseph story. As I was reading a biography of Schechter, I discovered that Schechter himself was, a, was an identical twin. And he and his brother had grown up in a, in a Hasidic village, in, a Hasidic shtetl in Romania, Schechter had gone to the West to have this academic career. His brother had gone to what was then Ottoman Palestine. His brother was actually one of the founders of the Israeli city of Zichron Yaakov. And he says that he visited his brother after, on his way home from Egypt, where he had gone to, you know, to, to discover the Geniza. So it was these, like, details that made me sort of think about the story behind the story in terms of who these, who these people really were, not as writers, not as thinkers, but as people. Great. Um... Toward the end of the book, um, Salman Schechter is talking to those two sisters, um, and he's talking about the discovery of, of all these texts, and he asks, um, did you ever feel that its discovery was a religious experience not only for you, but for the person who has written it as well? That is, did you ever sense that by finding that forgotten book, you were bringing its author back to life? Is that something that you feel also? I mean, many of these people that you've written about are not, some are, but n not necessarily household names in many Jewish homes or non-Jewish homes, depending on your reader. Does this feel like some way of bringing these people back to life and back into modern consciousness? I mean, if, I'm, if I succeeded, then yes. <laughs> I don't know, it's whether the reader can decide whether or not I succeeded, but I think that yes. I mean, and I would say not just with the characters, but with the material. Um, a lot of what I am doing as, a, as a, an American Jewish writer is, 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 a, is a recovery project. Um, and this is something that I've been doing since my first novel. And my first novel actually doesn't have any you know, famous historical figures walking through it, although my other ones do. Um, but in my first novel, there's uh, one of the central stories in the book is, about, is a story that um, one of the characters hears from an elderly man. And it's a story that I had heard from a grandfather of a friend who had come to the United States on a ship that carried many Jewish immigrants. And he said that he, when the ship pulled into New York Harbor, all of these Jewish immigrants, of course, went up on the deck to see the Statue of Liberty, to see the city. But uh, what this man said was that these people were not just um, looking at the Statue of Liberty. They were, when were going over to the edge of the deck, and they were throwing something into the water. And he went closer to see what they were doing, and he saw that these people were throwing their tefillin overboard. Because tefillin were something from the old world, and in the new world they wouldn't need them anymore. 
And what this man, uh, this elderly man, then told uh, this younger person, what and in my novel and also in the story I had heard from a friend, is I would like you to become a deep sea diver, to go down to the bottom of New York Harbor and bring those to fill in back up to dry land. To me, this is a a lot of a, a very central story of the Jewish experience is this project of recovery, and it's not we we sometimes forget that it isn't just a modern project. Um, this is something that is, um, I think it's it's in the Book of Kings, or is it Samuel or Kings? I'm, someone watching this is going to know this and now think, like, this woman doesn't know anything about the Bible. Um, King Josiah, um, they're doing a renovation project in the temple, and they find the scroll. Um, and this, they find this scroll, and they, they read this scroll, and they say, oh, my God, we're supposed to be doing these things like celebrating Passover. The scroll they find is the Torah implying that there have been several hundred years where they haven't been reading the Torah. Um, if you look at the scholarship, it really probably is the book of Devarim, of De uh, Deuteronomy, probably not the entire Torah, but nonetheless the idea that Passover would have been news to a, you know, to an Israelite king is, is, is very shocking, I think, to modern, um, you know, to, to a modern sensibility. And, but what it, I, what it shows you is that there was this, this sense of loss and recovery is kind of a constant cycle in Jewish life, and, you know, which only becomes more so in historical situations where you have tremendous losses, um, or even a situation in the United States where you have a tremendous cultural loss, where you have, this is a community that's not speaking a Jewish language anymore. Um, and so that's something that I've consciously done in all of my novels. Um, I've tried to sort of be that deep sea diver who goes to find that aspect of the, of the culture, of the, not, of, I would say of the religion, but it's, it's something, it's more than just the culture and the religion. It's something of, of a human story. Um, and to find that that cast off thing and bring it back to dry land. Um, so you know, shalom aleichem is a topic in my house. Um, yes. I felt, <laughs> felt very strongly that Jews had to be knowledgeable and not necessarily ritually or traditionally observant, but knowledgeable about Jewish culture, literature, history, people's stories. With all the talk of the Pew survey and you just mentioned the Jewish culture that. Now it may or may not be as strong in some communities um, where you know Jewish culture is equated with bagels and a schmear. Do you agree that people really need to be in order to continue Jewish culture? People really need to have that kind of knowledge. It sounds like from what you're just saying about being the deep sea diver, you do. Um, and to contribute to Jewish culture and creativity, what have you felt it essential for you to be knowledgeable about? Um. It's a good question. I mean, obviously, I come down on the side of uh, of knowledge. I mean, here I am talking to the Jewish <laughs> learning, right? I mean, you, I probably this would probably not have appealed to me um, if that if that wasn't important to me. Um, but I would say, well, look, there's a few things. I would say, first of all, for um, a, for Anglophone Jewish communities, I'm going to put it that way since this is a global day. Uh, for Anglophone Jewish communities, where th we're in a very unusual historical situation in um, in world history, and that these are large Jewish communities, especially of course in North America. But these are communities that are unusual, not unique, but unusual in Jewish history, in that these are communities that don't use a Jewish language. These are communities that use English, um, and obviously you can find other parallel communities in other parts of the world where people are using a non-Jewish language. And I think that a lot of the feeling that we have of an inauthentic cultural experience comes from the loss of a Jewish language. Um, and so to me, I think that the knowledge of those languages is extraordinarily important. Um, I, as you mentioned in your introduction, I have a doctorate in Hebrew and Yiddish literature. Obviously, this is something that's important to me. However, I do not feel that it is realistic for these communities to suddenly start learning these languages um, because of many reasons, which probably are not worth going into here, but I mean, especially in, in, in the United States, in North America, not less, much less so in Canada, but certainly in the United States, this is a very monolingual culture, um, where this isn't. Um, this is a very mon monolingual culture where the, it's not so. In, it's um, it's there are many very very high barriers to, not not necessarily to learning another language, but to using another language in daily life. So, one of the things I've tried to do in my novels, in a sense, is to write in English as though English were a Jewish language. And what I mean by that is not that I'm going to write a book full of like words in italics that only like you know certain people are going to understand, um, but rather that my novels are written in a way that they're where as 
as is traditional in, in Jewish languages, where the language of the text itself is drawn from from the Jewish religious experience. And I would say that this is not something that's like, I mean, I'm doing it consciously in English, but the truth is that every language has an archaeology of belief that's built into it. And native speakers of the language don't even hear it. So, I mean, when you're speaking in English and you say to somebody, go the extra mile, you're not thinking, oh, I'm quoting the Gospels. But, of course, you are. Or when you say to somebody in English, oh, this will happen for better or for worse, you know, you're not thinking, oh, I'm quoting the Anglican marriage ceremony. But you are. And, of course, when you speak in, a Jewish, in Jewish languages, those kinds of references are from the Torah, they're from the Mishnah, they're from the Siddur, they're from this sort of, you know, a, a library of Jewish texts. And so it's not that... You know, you're you know, most writers would not even necessarily deliberately insert those things, but as a writer who's writing in a non-Jewish language, I find myself bringing those texts into, into a non-Jewish language. And I'm doing it in a way that part of me does think that, you know, there's a way that readers can become familiar with these texts through this novel. Um, there was some interview with me. It was for, I think, a San Francisco Jewish paper where <laughs> my book was described as a gateway drug. <laughs> to Jewish learning, meaning like my book is like low grade pot, and my mom <laughs> like personal math. I don't think that's quite how they meant it, but I think that what they were saying was that you know someone who become interested in this subject who might not have otherwise seen it. I mean, to me that would be a wonderful thing. And look, my I have another job. I'm a college professor. You know, I'm obviously in favor of people learning. Um, but I also think that I think it's possible to have this culture in a non-Jewish language. I think it's been done before. I think it can be done again. I think it is being done now. Um, I think that we are very early in this process. Um, even though the American Jewish community, at least, is 350 years old, um, there's only been a few generations where this is secure enough in its place in America that it can explore this culture in a public way. Um, so in a sense, that is a very new procedure, a new, that's a very new experience to be able to explore this. So when you look at English language writers who are writing, um, or Jewish writers who are writing in, you know, in English, English language, the people who are in the gener uh, generations uh, before, before me, older than me, most of them were still, most of their, their subject was more about this question of assimilation and, you know, how can we get away from this, you know, being too Jewish and this kind of thing. And these are, like, these questions are less important for younger people. And I think that um, but in terms of the texts that I think are most important, I mean, I mean, uh, this is sort of obvious, I think the Torah, <laughs> um, to me, is this the most central text of, of Judaism and, and conveniently of Western civilization in a lot of ways as well. And I should say I'm a, I'm a Torah reader. I, I, I was, when I say I'm a Torah reader, I don't mean just that I know how to, to lean to read the Torah in, in the shul, but also that um, from the time when I was 12, when I was a teenager, I had this as a job where every week I was I was employed to read the Torah and the services. So I became familiar with the text very early, and I feel very fortunate to have had that experience, and I appreciate that not everybody does. Yeah, we actually, Rabbi Eli Comfer, who will be speaking later as part of the 24 by 24, um, did a blog post for the Jewish Book Council, Pros and People blog, um, comparing Jewish texts to a novel and saying, if you didn't know how to write, read a novel, um, but you went online and you saw all these bloggers writing about novels, but you never learned how to read the novel yourself. So you have sort of the interpretation of the bloggers, and that's as if you're reading the text. And it's really not quite reading the text. So for people who are interested in necessarily having the knowledge base that you have, which would take many years um, of study, but for people who are interested in finding out more about the characters and what you've written about in um, guide for the Perplexed, do you have sort of ideas of sources that they could go check out and read more directly? Yes, um, and in fact it's in the back of my, if you know, it's if you if you buy my book, <laughs> well it's in, in the back of my novel, I have um, an afterword that talks about um, what's true, what's not true in the book in terms of the historical material and other sources. Um, Obviously, uh, Guide for the Perplexed. Guide for the you know, Maimonides Guide for the Perplexed and Moreno Bukhim is like not an easy book. Um, I mean, it's it's a book that is it's not the kind of book you're gonna just buy and read by yourself. It's a book where you sort of need a class, you need a teacher, you need someone to work with you. Um, that said, there is actually a, a really excellent English language biography of Maimonides, which is the kind of thing that you can read on your own and and it's very accessible and also it's a very it also is it gives you a lot of the material that 
it gives you a lot of descriptions of his philosophy in a, in a very accessible way. That's a book called Maimonides, is the title, Maimonides, the subtitle is The Life and World of One of Civilization's Greatest Minds. The author is Joel Kramer, K-R-A-E-M-E-R, -E -E um, and so that's what I would, you know, recommend as the gateway drug to Maimonides. <laughs> I think that that's sort of, that's, you know, rather than going and buying Rambam and reading it by yourself. I mean, if you have a teacher who can teach it to you, or if you have a class you can take, obviously that I would recommend. Um, in terms of uh, Schechter and the Geniza, um, there are actually, I did a lot of research on the Geniza, and then and right when I was finished with what, basically I already had everything I needed, two books were published about the Geniza, which I'm like, man, couldn't you have published that two years ago, and I would have, like, you know, it would have been a lot easier for me. Um, but you now can benefit from them, you listeners. Um, there's two books that are about the history of the discovery of the Geniza, in which Schechter is a major character. Um, amusingly, one is called Sacred Treasure, and one is called Sacred Trash. They're both really good. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so I just want to say that we'll, I have a couple more questions, and then we'll open it up for question and answer. So anyone who has those questions, tweet them in, fill out the form, whatever you want. Also, we wanted to shout out to um, Ravi, Ravi Devi, on, who is live tweeting Dara's talk. So if you don't have a chance to watch right now or you have to run, um, you can check the tweets out um, online as well. Um, so Dara, I wanted to... Um, in the, you mentioned earlier, how do you think technology has affected creativity now? So you talk about in the book how the social media and online, everything now is preserved for us. Our whole lives can be on, you know, collected into data points, essentially. And that, um, and I've seen in a previous interview, you also talk about how deciding what to remember is really part of who someone is and how helps shape that identity. So how do you think technology is now affecting creativity? Let's remember that we're now on a Google chat being broadcast to the world to talk yes. about Jewish learning. <laughs> sure. Well, I'm going to say first that, um, you know, unlike uh, many writers and artists, I am very much, uh, I'm, I'm all in favor of technology. Um, I should say that uh, I am myself a product of modern technology, and I mean that entirely literally. My parents met in 1966 through the world's first computer dating service. Wow. I could not make this up. They're still married. <laughs> um, many years later, they're still married. So, um, so I, I could not make this up. Um, and uh, I'm also married to someone who's building drones in the basement of our house. That's a whole <laughs> other. That's a whole other podcast. And yeah. Um, so you know, this is very much part of my life. Um, I'm not one of these people who's like, oh, Twitter is for losers. Like, no, that's not me. Um, what I will say about the technology. You asked about technology and creativity. I would. Um, back that up one step to technology and memory. Um, and what I will say, which is, you know, of course, relevant to this, in that um, part of the, my, my story in, the, in Guide for the Perplex is this discussion of the difference between history and memory. Um, first thing I would say is just that the difference between technology and memory, um, or this, the way that technology change, is changing memory, this problem is so old that Plato wrote about it. <laughs> I'm not making this up. There's one of Plato's books, the uh, Phaedrus, is a one of the dialogues of Socrates. Socrates is complaining about how technology is changing memory forever and destroying memory because we have now this new technology called writing. And now that people can write, who will memorize the epics of Homer anymore? I'm like, you know, it turns out he was right. Nobody memorizes yeah, the epics of Homer. <laughs> um, that is true. He was right about that. What he didn't really think about was when your brain is not taken up with an entire, you know, uh, you know, the epics of Homer, that there might be room in your mind for other things. Um, and and there, in a sense that we, so this idea of offloading parts of your mind to other sources is not is not new at all. Um, and 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 also the the sort of the dangers with that are associated with that are not new at all. And and the changing from technology one technology to another in terms of creativity is also a really old problem. Um, People are talking about, like, oh, don't you get mad when people are reading your book on the Kindle? I'm like, um, no, first of all, anybody buying my book, I'm happy. Um, <laughs> but I, really that it's, people were just as upset about the change in reading when there was a transition from scroll to book. Because 
there is a real difference between the way you read a scroll and the way you read a book. When you read a scroll, you have to read it the way it's written. You start with chapter one, you start with the very first beginning sentence of that work, and you read all the way to the end. And if you're on chapter five and you forgot what happened in chapter one, you can't like flip back and check. No. Um, a fact that perhaps uh, those who have you know th those who have compiled the the texts we know as the Torah perhaps took advantage of that possibility and said like well if there's a discrepancy no one might notice um, but you know you really can't flip back so easily you have to read it along and people did feel at the time when books became the new technology that this was going to destroy the reading experience because now anybody who just wants to read chapter three can just read chapter three. It's very much the same way we feel about um, the internet, where it's like, oh, this is such a shallow experience because you know, you're giving the reader too much control. So this is a very, very old problem. Um, what I will say about, um, in terms of um, memory and history, specifically in a Jewish point of view, um, Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi, the great his Jewish historian um, of the, the late Middle Ages and early modern period, he has a book called Zachor. Um, which means, of course, remember, remember, and it's about the collect. It's about collective memory in, in in Jewish life. And what he talks about in that book is that there's no, you don't. Not until you get to the the early modern period is there any history being written in the Jewish community. And you think about that, and you're like, they're like, there's no idea of history. And they're like, you know, as modern people, we look at that and we're like, are you crazy? I feel like as Jews, that's all we do. Um, but what he means is that there wasn't this idea of, of history the way you have like Herodotus or other ancient historians who are writing about, really writing annals of what's been going on in contemporary, in their time for the future. Instead, what he says, and this is of course just his opinion, but what he says, instead what you have is this idea that you're reenacting the past. And everything that happens is just, a, you know, in a sense, that nothing new has ever happened since biblical times, and everything that's happening is a rewrite of whatever was happening later. Something um, like and it's that, that's in mind. So yes, yes, exactly. And but not just you know, but also, and I think you see it all the time. I mean, I can't think of like in the past five years, I don't think I ever went to like a Megillah reading at Purim where somebody didn't mention. Iran and Ahmadinejad and how this is happening again. I mean, now Ahmadinejad is not even there anymore, and we still talk about this. Um, you know, I mean, I think that there's this idea that you're re you're repeating the past, that nothing new ever happens, and and so that's um, that's something that I think does matter for creativity um, in terms of technology and creativity. Um, what what the the theme that I specifically specifically explore in the novel is that is the idea of replacing memory with history, it, with technology. Um, when you have these technology that can record really everything in your life, um, and it's not quite to the state that it is in my book, in the real world, but um, I do feel that there are people, um, I'm 36 years old, and there are people who are um, maybe 10 years younger than me, who, for whom they will never have the experience of meeting a stranger. And what I mean by that is that anybody who meets them in some way, whether it's a job interview or dating or roommates or whoever, that person will already have, a bill, have access to a tremendous amount of information about that person, which that person doesn't even necessarily control. Um, and so in a sense, there's a way in which you have um, our ability to sort of create our own story, to selectively remember the past, is in some way diminished. But at the same time, this it can also be augmented because there are people who make a very conscious effort to cultivate the way that they appear online and, and to create that as that is their story, and how and they're able to present that. So I think you know, we're in a transitional moment, like scroll to book, you know, oral oral, oral literature to written literature. I mean, you know, creativity has survived these transitions before. So as an author, you must get. Um, when you meet readers, you must um, have a lot to hear about readers' interpretations of your work. And there's a lot in this book, in the Guide for the Perplexed, about reader interpretation. Not necessarily reader interpretation, but you know, even with um, whatever information is stored online or you know, at sort of documented memories, they're still subject to a lot of interpretation. So yes. in the book, when Solomon Chester is talking about talking to his brother. He and his brother have each interpreted a teaching of their father in entirely different ways that have really shaped their lives. Or when Josie is thinking about her daughter, and her memories of her daughter are so different from what she sees online, she's taken that interpretation and sort of made it her own. How do you have, I mean, have you had a lot of readers who come up and, you know, share their interpretations? How has that impacted you looking back on your work or going forward with your work? 
Um, well, I can say that readers, the way I, that I, the interactions I have with readers have influenced my work um, in general terms, aside from this question about, um, you know, creating your own story that you're talking about and, and you know, the falsifications of the past. Um, I will say that um, even just in writing this novel, I remember I had a reader who approached me after my third book came out, this is my fourth book, after my third book came out and said, you know, you're a terrific writer, I love your work, but why don't you ever write about women characters? I had never thought about it before. It just never occurred to me. And, and I have one in my first novel that one of the main characters is a woman, but it's true that I had not really written seriously about from women's points of view. And so I sort of set that for myself as a challenge So with this novel. So it is it's definitely what readers say to me about the book has an impact on what I choose to do next. Um, you know, I sort of, I do interpret that feedback, and that is important to me. Um, but to go back to your, um, your earlier question, or, or sort of the question behind that question about... Um, the way about the falsifications of history and, and falsifications of memory. Um, in a sense, the whole novel is about um, how, in a, there, while there is an objective past, there is an objective truth, there is an objective reality, we have no access to that objective past. Because any way of looking at the past is an interpretation. It's some, someone's perspective. And that's part of the reason why I, it, there's so many sibling relationships in the book. Because siblings are like this microcosm of looking at that problem, where you have people who have ostensibly lived the same life and had the same childhood, um, but often you will talk to adult siblings and you would never know that they grew up in the same house. Um, even not just from who, the different people they've become, but even in the way that they remember that house and that, and that, and that life. Um, so, that's, so that question is something that has been important in, in exploring this book. And um, in terms of reader interpretations, I there are, there are many layers to that in the novel, and I can say that I personally, as the author, I've I lost track of them because I met a reader in Austin, Texas last week who was talking about the false histories in the book. And it is true that, and I'm not going to give it away because I know not everyone has read it, but toward the end there is this uh, situation where a main character sort of creates a false history of herself and her relationship with another character. And that false history has major impact on, on other people around her. Um, and one of these, this reader in Texas pointed out, she said, well, you know, this false history is something you do throughout the book. She said, starting when the main character arrives in contemporary Egypt, and when she arrives in Egypt, she arrives in October, and she's there, there's a, there's a national holiday where there are parades through the city, uh, military parades, celebrating their victory over Israel in what Jews think of as the Yom Kippur War, the war in 1973. The fact that Egypt did not actually win the Yom Kippur War in no way affects the festivities. Now, I included that just because that was something I happened to know about contemporary Egypt, that they celebrate the victory in this war that they, in fact, lost. I mean, I just thought it was kind of funny, but it's true that it, was it's part of that whole idea of the false history and how the false history impacts the future. Um, it, it is something that I that I think about a lot. And in terms of what um, the what re, how readers see the books, one thing that I have learned is that as an author, you write one book. But if you're fortunate to be published and to be widely read, what you discover is that everybody who's reading your book is reading a different book than the book you wrote, which is actually not such a bad thing because they're often reading a better book than the book you wrote. <laughs> so that's something that I have discovered is that there, um, different readers will, will uh, appreciate different aspects of, of my books, and, um, and that's one of the things that's been more rewarding to me in terms of interacting with readers. Yeah, and I know you do a lot of interacting with book clubs as well, so I'm sure that that comes up many times when you're um, speaking to book clubs. Um, so this, based on, from um, the end of your last book, again, in that conversation with Solomon Chester and the twins, um, he, they're talking about um, palimpsests. So for people who don't know, that's a text that's been written over um, with another text. Is that something that you see in your own work? I mean, it is, I think, a very apt metaphor for what I'm, at least what I'm trying to do. Again, whether I succeed is in, up, up to the reader, but um, that is what I'm, in a sense, trying to do, is writing writing over another work. Um, I mean, I think that, I mean, I, I see my work as very indebted to Jewish literature of the past, um, starting with the Torah, but also, you know, expanding far beyond that. And to me, part of this is, um, 
I, I talked at the beginning of our, our of our conversation about this different idea in Western and Jewish uh, civilizations about creativity, and about the idea of the artist as someone who creates something out of nothing, and that this is sort of the ideal in Western art and Western literature. I think that this is um, this is something that that I I'm I, I'm very uncomfortable with as a Jewish writer because. To me, this idea of some, creating something out of nothing, in a sense, is it, it, it creates a problem with idolatry. Um, with this, you know, there's a hesitation about creativity in Jewish life because of this idea that there is a creator, and it's not you. And there's a kind of a hubris in creating a world, um, and I think that you see that hesitation, um, partly in the idea that the collaboration is okay, but the individual. Um, the individual invention is much less so, um, and you see that you see that hesitation also even in the communal, in the Jewish communal ideal that that you know that in, in, in effect individuality is is a far less important value than 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 community than the community collaborative experience, and I think that that's um that's something that that I that's a hesit that hesitation about idolatry is something that I think about a lot, and I think you see it in my novels because each of my novels in a sense is about a creative person. Who is thwarted by their own creativity? Um, in this novel, of course, it's about this software developer um, whose program itself sort of leads to both her destruction and 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 possibly her rescue. But it's it becomes something that kind of destroys her in a lot of ways. Um, I, my previous book about the spies in the Civil War really was about actors and sort of this I you know that sort of the danger of of that kind of creativity. I had another novel about artists. I had another novel about photographers. And so this question, so in a sense, my characters. Are acting out this problem of creativity and sort of the boundaries of knowledge, and in a sense, the idea that um, if you believe in an omniscient God, there has to be there has to be some boundary between um, your creativity and, and and divine creativity, and it's sort of the motion and the blurriness of that boundary that that interests me as a writer. Great. Um, so we have one or two questions. Um, that came in from our audience. We have one, um, which is a question about when your readership. So, when you're writing, are you thinking about your readership? Are you thinking about people of a certain demographic or age? And if so, are those the people who you end up speaking to? Um, you know, when I'm writing the books, I'm not really thinking about the readership very much. I mean, and, and I think that. Um, no, I mean when I well, while I'm writing, I'm not really thinking about it. The only time I think about it is when I am introducing these um, historical concepts. Because and then I would say it's not even necessarily Jewish concepts as much as something when it's historical material. You know, you have some explaining that you have to do because you can't you can't assume that all of your readers like well, of course they know what it's like in 12th century Cairo. And I don't know that, you know, I don't, not that I even know that much about 12th century Cairo, but I know enough to write this chapter about it. Um, and so there's a lot of these information that you kind of have to find some graceful way to convey. Um, so that's, that's and, and, you know, and, and thinking about what you can assume your readers know and what you can't assume they know. So that's, that's something I think about. In terms of, of, of age or demographics, yeah, I don't really think about it very much. I mean, I will say that you know most people who you know there are you know it's often older people who go to literary events, but it's also often older people who go to any events. I mean, quite honestly, and and I you know, I have four small children at home. I mean, it's pretty rare that I get out in the evening. So I mean, like I wouldn't be going to book events if I wasn't the person behind the you know behind the microphone. <laughs> so you know, I think that there's you know there's there's that, but um, I think that you know it's so that's that's you know I, I don't really think about who's reading it. I mean, in terms of you know, one thing that has surprised me is that um, my books have found a, a fairly large uh, Christian audience, and that's something that that took me by surprise with my first book. Um, and I've been invited to speak at churches and at um, Christian conferences and things like that. And um, that's something that that I hadn't expected. And I think that the fact that that surprised me, um, in a sense, reflected how how narrow my view of literature was before I started publishing these books. In a sense, I had underestimated the Possibilities that literature presents. That, in other words, I thought this was a book for people like me, whatever that means, whether it was Jewish or women or young people or whatever it was. But what I didn't realize is that the whole point of literature is communication. And um, what I find is that um, you know, there's you you never really know who your audience is. And um, you know, my books have been translated; they're read in different parts of the world. And people, of course, see different um, people. You know, people see different things in them depending on the the angle that they're approaching it from. Great. And uh, I think one last question. Um, so, 
So when you were talking about something from nothing, you know, there's a couple of great children's stories that have turned that into an idea of one called something from nothing, and also Joseph had an overcoat, um, which is, you know, they had something, and then you can't create something from nothing, but you can create a story. So are you working on, I'm sure you are working on new stories, but are you working on new novels, short stories? What kind of pieces are you working on now? Um, well, I've never, I've, I actually only written one short, one short story in my life. Um, which was, uh, it was really just a joke, actually. It was called Shtetl World. It was about a shtetl theme park. Um, <laughs> it's like, literally, there's rides, there's costume interpreters. Every day at 2 o'clock, there's a wedding. Every day at 4 o'clock, there's a pogrom. So, I mean, it was a joke. It was not going to be longer than, like, 20, you know, 15 pages. Um, but, you know, I, I don't really write in short stories. I write novels. Um, you know, I am starting something new, but I will say that um, my books tend to start with 100 pages that I throw away. <laughs> So um, it's a little bit like a it's a little bit like a pregnancy. Like it's you know you don't want to talk about it too early because you don't know if it's going to work out. <laughs> so I would I would hesitate to say uh, say much beyond that. But uh, I, I you know it's it's a mystery to me. And then I, I will say that as I write one even once I have um, you know a premise or a situation that I'm starting with, um, my my books you know, I I write I, I don't plan them at all. I mean I don't have an outline or anything like that. I really am writing them the same way that you would read them, like to find out what happens next. So. I get to be the first person who finds out what happens next. Great. Um, so I think we're going to wrap up. We're almost out of time. Dara, thank you so much for your time. This was a great conversation. People who are interested in reading your book, it's A Guide for the Perplexed, um, or the, the most recent one, um, and is available at any place where you can buy books. Um, Dara obviously is a great mind and speaker and writer. Um, if anyone is interested in reading guides or discussion questions, um, they are available both on the W. w Norton site, on Dara's website, and also on the Jewish Book Council Book Club site, um, so you can check that out. Um, and um, you can also, if you want to see this conversation again, um, it will be posted on the uh, Global Day of Jewish Learning site, the 24 by 24 so globalday.com, theglobalday.com, sorry, slash 24 by 24. So you can replay us to your heart's content. Thank you very much, and have a great week. Thank you for having me. And thank you, Mary. This is a lovely conversation. I enjoyed it, too. Yeah, this was great. Thank you.